Okay, this is Mr. Anderson for Math 130. Uh, in the first day, uh, we are going to basically skim over a lot of Chapter 1, The Nature and Probability of Statistics. Uh, this video will outline what we covered in class on the first day. It will also kind of uh, really shorten up and, and summarize what the first chapter is all about. Um, what is descriptive statistics? Um, descriptive statistics is the collection, organization, the summarization, and the presentation of data. Uh, an example of this is uh, the census. Uh, we collect uh, census data uh, every 10 years, and then we do our best to try to say, well, this is a snapshot of of every of, of the United States of America. Um, also, sales is another way to collect all the data and just say, okay, this is how many copies of a record album has sold or how much a video game has sold, um, and those charts and those ranks are uh, part of that collection of everything. Um, now, inter uh, inferential statistics, um, these are generalizing from uh, samples of samples to populations. Uh, it's performing estimations, hypothesis tests, relationships, and making predictions. Uh, for example, um, political polling. Um, it, you're taking just a small part of a population and you're uh, basically giving that, you know, an entire representation for, for the total population because, um, you know, you can't go around and ask every single person what they feel about a political topic, but you can do so in, in a very small amount and then extrapolate that to a bigger thing. Uh, gambling is also inferential as well because you can kind of um, get the idea from small events, uh, from from the statistics of how gambling is done, and you can then make uh, an, uh, a guess, an estimation, and even a very accurate um, exam. You know, a very accurate um, uh, probability or percentage of what is going to happen. And um, when I talked about population and samples, a uh, population is a group of subjects and a sample is uh, a small part of that group. So um, in the census, we could take a look at the entire uh, population um, right there. Oops, sorry to scroll that a little bit weird. Uh, it, we could take a look at the entire population within the 10 year census, and then the sample would be a small part of that. Now, what is probability? Probability is a chance for an event to occur. Uh, the probability, for example, uh, is always written as a fraction. Um, uh, the fraction would be like uh, a numerator and denominator. The top number would be the uh, chances of it occurring, and the bottom of the denominator would be um, the number of outcomes. So, for example, flipping a coin is one half. Uh, rolling a five on a six sided die is one out of six, because there's only one five on the die. And that is going to be covered uh, very in depth in chapter four. Um, what's a variable? Now we're going to talk a little bit about variables because variables, uh, it's a characteristic or attribute that can assume different values. Uh, a variable can be something that changes or something that we don't um, actually know when we start the problem. In mathematics, it's given as usually the letter X, uh, and then a lot of your algebra class is spent solving for X, trying to find what it is. Um, we're going to take a look at some um, different types of variable, and I'm going to take them in a vertical column format here, and they're defined in the book. There are nominal variables, and those nominal variables are mutually exclusive groups with no order or ranking. Uh, mutually exclusive is uh, two, they're two different things that have no overlap. Like, for example, um, gender, uh, you can say male or female, and in uh, the strictest sense, you would have the XY and XX chromosome defining gender, and those are two mutually exclusive groups. Um, we also have hair color. Um, and if you break those into some simple groups, then you would have mutually exclusive groups, where blonde versus brunette. Um, belief systems uh, and nationalities, these are all different mutually exclusive groups, but they have no order. Um, so you cannot say uh, one hair color um, or eye color is greater than the other color. Now, when we talk about ordinal, um, they're ranked but nice, not really precise. Um, for example, a, a movie ranking. Um, uh, obviously, people can give uh, video games and movies and television shows uh, ranks, but um, they're not very precise. Somebody's four out of five is somebody else's B out of an A scale, um, which also goes to grades. 
And um, this is what if you subjectively say, oh, I give that an A, you know, without giving the criteria or percentages. That's an example of ordinal, um, ordinal variables there. Um, entertainment, judging, you know, these kind of subjective things that are ranked but just not very precise. Even with a, a rubric, it could still fall into that rank. Um, interval. Interval, when you rank something but you're you know, but you're you're precise and there's no true zeros. For so for example, SAT scores, ACT scores, if you know if you're from Michigan there. Um, IQ and temperature, these are all different precise rankings, but there's no true zero. And a ratio would be um, well like the interval, but a true zero exists. Like there's a zero age, a zero height, a zero salary, a zero time. Um, I guess not in the philosophical sense, but you know, like uh, you hit the stopwatch at zero. Um, there, are, just like just like it says in the book, man, there are people who will argue uh, incessantly about the types of groups that these should be in, and some people would say grades are intervals because you can have a grade from 90 to 100 percent as an A to minus to an A plus. But then someone would say, well, what makes that grade is ordinal because it's not precise until. You know, so you can get into some great arguments about that, but these are the general definitions and examples. Um, okay, qualitative variables. Um, a qualitative variable is a characteristic or attribute um, that's not numerical, you know, gender, type, style, you know, so qualitative variable. But where quantitative is definitely numerical or ranked. Um, there are two different types of the quantitative variables, and there's a cool picture in the book about this. Um, it's a little branching tree, but it, the quantitative variables are discrete, which means they can be counted, you know, they're finite, easily measured, like how many of them are there? Um, and there's continuous. Uh, they can assume an infinite number of values between two numbers, like an average, a fraction, a decimal answer. So the discrete is if you can actually count the variables that are used and continuous would be, well, if, if it's not so, you know, exact, um, like a fraction is considered continuous, an average. So um, this, there's fine nuances between these two here, but um, this, if, if it's easy, easy quantitative data, you call it discrete, and if it's not really easy, I know I'm simplifying this quite a bit, it'd be considered continuous. Um, now, when we talk about uh, data, one of the more important things, and you're, this is this is probably the biggest, this is the only huge mathematical concept in this first chapter, is to determine a boundary. And it's the plus or minus the final unit or decimal given in the problem. So um, let's explain here for a moment. Um, if I tell you that there's like 15 cats, or 15 uh, sweaters, or 15 uh, dollars. The boundary for that 15 is one decimal beyond the value given. So for example, the one decimal beyond a whole number is the tenth part of that decimal, so 15.0. That would mean that the boundary is within one whole number of that 15.0. So that one whole number is split halfway above 15, and halfway below 15. So the boundary of 15 is between $14.50 and $15.50. Which seems kind of weird, but you think about it, if I talked about my first example was 15 cats, well that would be between 14 and a half cats and 15 and a half cats, which again in the realistic example, that doesn't make any sense. What is 14 and a half and 15 and a half? I mean, uh, in, a, in terms of human beings and, and animals, we're given with integers, whole, you know, well, actually whole numbers in this case. But uh, that, you can see where, you know, we talk, start talking about money. If we're talking about $105, that would be uh, between $104 and $105, $104.50, But then we get into ideas and data, in, like let's say we have $2.30. Well, the boundary of 2000, the, the, the rounding boundary or the uh, bar graph boundary, histograph boundary of that would be uh, between, you know, one extra decimal. So imagine that $2.30, well, that would be between $2.25 and $2.35. Um, one way to think about it is you could say, well, um, I'm needed to go, I need to go to um, make a bound for $8.67. So you would add a five, 
um, and that would take you to the upper bound. And then you would subtract that five tenths, hundredths, thousandths. So that would be 665 instead of 670. So that's one way to do it. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot more of that, especially in week um, in week two, where we're going to be looking at bar graphs and histograms and charts that um, will need a bound of some sort. All right, let's talk about taking uh, types of data collections here. Um, now I left these examples a blank, but um, we would we would write these down in our class. But if if I take a random sample of data. So we're just trying to gather data, a random sample just as it implies. I'm going to pull the first five people I see in the lunchroom to give them a question. Um, an example, just random pick. You know, you're not actually concerned about anything else other than that it's completely random. I'm just going to pick these people. A systematic uh, data collection is where you're picking the, the kth person or thing. So you're just saying, okay, I'm going to take the fifth person who walks into this room and ask them these questions. Um, then we have uh, stratified separating into two by def a defining characteristic and then pick a small group from there. So I'm gonna basically go into a lunchroom and split the room mentally into men and women and then I will pick a group of men to represent all the men and a group of women to represent all the women. And a cluster is where you don't stratify, you stratify. You just pick a smaller group that's representative of the entire whole and then extrapolate from there. Um, and that's great um, when you can do that and really represent the entire population. All right, uh, moving on, moving on, let's see. Important vocabulary with respect to the different types of studies that we have, like um, an observational study is you observe the current or past and try to predict the future. For an example, um, I'm gonna loosely say insurance rates. Now, uh, I know actuaries who really do their uh, job to try to figure out how much you should charge uh, a certain teen with a certain, um, a certain um, background, how much to charge them for uh, insurance rates. And these are mathematical and they're very, uh, very, very calculating. So I just say, generally speaking, insurance rates can be an example of trying to predict the future. Uh, they take... Uh, crash rates of people in different categories and then assign well there's this much risk associated with it. Um, voting trends is also like they can take a look at a certain population and say oh well that's how that's how they're gonna vote. Now here's the success failure rate. Um, you can also take a look at you know how many students in a certain class based on the past will pass or fail and you can take the more and more variables you look at the better that is gonna be. How about an experimental study? Well, there you start to change a variable and see how it changes the other. So for example, it's like, well, I mean, we noticed that, you know, from the observational study, the, the insurance rate should be higher for the younger students. So we're gonna change maybe a law or some kind of driver's training procedure that will maybe try to affect what happens to them in the future to, you know, change insurance rates. So um, the independent variable is what you can change. This is the x-axis the x-axis in um, your, um, your x and y axis. And um, you can draw an x and y axis here, which we're gonna do um, in class, um, or you can do on the computer. Um, now it says, what's the dependent variable? Well, it's, it's the result of what happens, it's the y axis. So if you have your L-shaped x and y axis, the, um, the, my thumb is the x-axis, and that would be what you can change. This would be maybe the price of an item and the y-axis, this, this area right here, that is going to be like uh, how much profit you make. So maybe if you raise the price of an object, maybe the profit will go down because people will stop buying it. Um, or maybe it'll form a, a, a nice parabola because you're not gonna make any money at the low price and then it'll go up and then down again. So this is the independent variable and this is a dependent variable. Y depends on X. And play those games in your head. You know, what depends on what? You know, distance depends on time. So time is the x-axis and distance is the y-axis. And that was a little math 101 for you there. All right. So I gave you some examples of an independent dependent variable relationship. For example, the changing of a ticket price will affect the profit. Um, homework time will affect the grade. 
So as homework time goes up, you hope to see grade go up, so you see a positive correlation. And we'll be looking at correlations near the end of the class um, on scatter plots and lines of best fits and all that fun stuff. Oh, confounding variable. I like confounding variables. It's something that can affect the dependent variable that was not removed from the independent variable. Um, an example of a confounding variable, uh, maybe a death in a family, emotional stress, car breaks down, the computer <laughs> smokes. I, I basically wrote that down to say the computer crashed. So if you, you know, you can look at a, a series of data and you'll notice that some of these outliers are in there. Well, it might have to do with one of these confounding variables. You, you can't take into account any of these things that might, uh, you know, look at your values um, or might uh, affect the outcome. So you might have had like a, you notice like, wow, that test didn't go so well, but there might have been something like some emotional stress in that class or uh, might have been something that happened in the room that might have affected it. It was a confounding variable. You know, somebody pulled a fire alarm or um, it was, you know, <laughs> it, the, the test was um, the Monday after Super Bowl, Sunday. I mean, there's all these confounding variables. So what we're going to do is um, I would like you to read, this is uh, pages 16 through 18 in the book for misuses of statistics. And I love this topic because you can really dive deep into all the crazy misuses and crazy um, problems in statistics. And this is, this is a fun one. This is a fun one to just check on your own Google search. And um, it's pretty entertaining. So uh, that is uh, the first day. Back to the top here, chapter one, the nature and probability of statistics.